قوله قول صدق وفعله مأمون أجب نداء السماء يا سيد الأنبياء أجب نداء السماء يا سيد الأنبياء After the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam met Ibrahim alayhi salam and he had a greeting with him and Baytul Ma'mur. Then Jibra'il took him to this spot called Sidratul Muntaha. It is actually mentioned in the Quran in Surah Al-Najm verse 12 onwards where uh, Allah tells us that Jibra'il was seen, you know, in a second ascending or descending, uh, uh, you know, by the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Second descending means that Jibra'il was shown for the second time in his original form to the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Uh, and Sidratul Muntaha actually means a lot tree. It is a tree which has a gigantic um, um, span, uh, sorry, space uh, covered by it. Its shadow, its shadow cover, covers a huge space and it was a huge tree and some reports actually describe what the tree looked like. Uh, it was a tree which had fruit like uh, the pictures of Hajar. I don't know what the pictures of Hajar looked like. The Prophet described uh, to his companions what the fruit actually looked like the pi pictures or the pots of Hajar you know uh, and I simply don't know what they looked like the Sahaba knew and then he said the the leaves were like the the ears of elephants okay so this was a very pleasant tree which smelled very pleasant its food was very nice uh, as the Prophet was told and at this spot Jibrail stopped it's called Sidratul Muntaha lotus tree is the final point uh, it is the end, basically, for anyone else except those Allah allows to go further. And it's Sidratul Muntaha. It's at the furthest end, if you like. It's where everything ends. Everything from, it's the furthest end of the heavens. So he's reached the uh, furthest point in the seventh heaven. This is how it's described. Beyond which is, comes next is meeting with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or his conversation with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But here he sees Sidratul Muntaha. Some narrations say it, it's a tree. And uh, when he looked at it, he saw the fruits of the tree. They looked insignificant, just normal. But then when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's command came, the, it bore some beautiful colors and beautiful fruits. Uh, it was indescribable um, in terms of its beauty and everything. And also some narrations, um, like in Bukhari, says there's four rivers flowing from Sidratul Muntaha. Two of them are hidden, rivers of Jannah, and two are the uh, rivers of this world, the Euphrates and the River Nile. Their source starts at Sidratul Muntaha. So these are, um, in other narrations, these two rivers are from the rivers from the heaven. Here we have another idea, another point Allah is trying to make through this incident that Adam, Isa and Yahya, Yusuf, Musa, Harun, Idris, and Ibrahim alayhi salam, alayhi salam, all of them were met, and then the Prophet ﷺ was taken beyond them, above them, you know, because he's the final messenger of Allah. He needs more strengthening than anyone else because his ummah is the weakest. His ummah is the weakest. His ummah hasn't seen those things the previous ummah was shown, right? So he needs stronger support in that sense. So he was taken to that point where no one else has gone. So the Prophet ﷺ was asked to go beyond Sidratul Muntaha from this point onwards. And there he was shown um, um, uh, four rivers, for example. Uh, and Jibrail told him that these four rivers, I mean, two were visible and two were actually invisible. And uh, the angel Jibrail told the Prophet ﷺ that those two that are visible are the river Nile and the river Euphrates, which is in Mesopotamia or in Iraq, uh, to be more precise. Okay, and the two hidden rivers are the rivers of Jannah. Okay, so they are both in Jannah and they will be seen by the people of Jannah. Uh, not that the Prophet, the Prophet was shown them, okay, they are, but they are invisible from human eyes. The, the ones human eyes can see are the river Nile and river Euphrates. Here, it doesn't mean that these rivers are actually coming from the heavens, right? The Prophet was shown these rivers to highlight the point that these rivers are 
a great blessing of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for humanity. And if you think about these two rivers and study the history, you will see why. Because there would be no life in Egypt and no Egyptian civilization without the River Nile. River Nile is the lifeline of millions of people. Egypt was and is the most important country uh, in Africa when it comes to, uh, you know, in Northern Africa, if you want to put it that way, when it comes to, you know, agriculture, and it all depends on the River Nile. Likewise, Euphrates, the oldest civilization in uh, human history, you know, uh, what, we know, uh, known, uh, what we know today as the Mesopotamian civilization, it depends on River Euphrates. Okay, so these were great blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So again, another event happens here and Jibreel alayhi salam was shown because he comes in different forms. But here he was shown in his original form and uh, with his hundreds of wings, you know, some narration says 600 wings. So in his full size and form, uh, in his original form, so again the Prophet uh, sees Jibreel alayhi salam uh, in his original form and also this is mentioned in Surah Al-Najm. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says لَقَدْ رَأَى مِنْ آيَاتِ رَبِّهِ الْكُبْرَى He has seen from the great signs of his Lord and because this is a sort of generalized verse then the people of Tafsir have uh, indulged and in fact starting with the companions and later on what does Al-Ayat Al-Kubra what are these great things that the Prophet saw uh, some have said that it was the whole experience of seeing Bayt al-Maqdis, seeing the prophets, meeting the different prophets. Some said that it was Jibreel because he saw Jibreel in his original form, something which didn't happen regular. I mean, in some narrations that uh, Jibreel, uh, the Prophet only saw Jibreel in his original form twice uh, with his, uh, you know, 600 wings and his, his, his great uh, appearance and stature. Uh, others say that it was the Sudrat al-Muntaha, the low tree, which is uh, which signifies the end or the, the last position above uh, the heavens. Uh, and some say that some of the signs that he saw was in fact that he saw Allah uh, subhanahu wa ta'ala. <laughs> So all that's happened up to now has been almost like a, a very uh, dramatical introduction to what is the whole peak of the Isra al Mi'raj. So up to now he has met uh, all the prophets, he's seen the angels, he's seen the great signs of Allah, he's, he's seen the majesties of Allah's creation and now this all leads up to the great climax of meeting Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, something which very few humans have uh, experience through the, the century. It is so spectacular, so great that Jibreel السلام, who has been his companion throughout this journey uh, has to unfortunately uh, for the Prophet السلام, in the sense that he felt that Jibreel is now leaving him, cannot come with him, cannot accompany him in this, in this great meeting uh, with the Lord of the worlds. So Jibreel السلام, reaches that point and says you must now, I can't stay with you Muhammad or I can't pass beyond this point, it is for you to go on. And that in itself indicates that the Prophet Sallallahu status is even higher than Jibreel السلام, because he's now allowed to transcend a point where great angels and, and archangels aren't uh, allowed uh, to pass by. All meeting uh, to come up to the meeting with Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala uh, and to speak to Him directly. There are two views on this point that the Prophet ﷺ actually met Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in person and the distance between Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the Prophet ﷺ was as big as two, the size of two bows, you know, bow and arrow, two bows. Uh, but did the Prophet ﷺ actually see Allah with naked eye? This is a very controversial issue and scholars have differed uh, in this regard. We have two opinions, mainly coming from the companions of the Prophet ﷺ. Um, one is the view of Abdullah bin Masood and Aisha radiallahu anha that the Prophet sallallahu did not see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay, of course we have a verse in the Quran which states that believers will be seeing Allah after they die and they will meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the hereafter. Uh, and hadith also testifies to that fact. But as for this life, can believers actually see Allah with naked eye? Uh, it is not clear. Aisha's opinion was the Prophet sallallahu did not see Allah. On the other hand, we have the opinion of Abdullah bin Abbas, but these statements are not very explicit or very categorical in the wording. 
Abdullah bin Abbas did not categorically say that the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam saw Allah with naked eye. He simply said he saw Allah. Now, in what form? We simply don't know how he saw Allah subhanahu wa taala. Um, some scholars suggest that Abdullah bin Abbas, in other reports, stated that he saw Allah from his heart. Okay, not from his eye, not in the physical form, because we don't believe Allah subhanahu wa taala uh, is physical in that sense. Okay, so. How he saw Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we simply have no idea. There is nothing conclusive in this regard. And Imam Qurtabi, he put it very nicely that uh, there are groups who believe uh, one thing and there are groups who believe in a, a, another view based upon whatever their understanding of the evidence is. But he said that we should not put so much too much stress or emphasis on this point because it is not important for us. It doesn't affect or shouldn't affect our ibadah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Our dedication, our love for Allah and His Messenger, it simply cannot or do not affect that uh, particular uh, issue. So we should not be putting too much stress on the point we have no knowledge of. So we have no certain knowledge as to how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, you know, revealed Himself to Allah, the, uh, the Prophet of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa what kind of meeting it was, um, there's no description, there is no authentic sources to say, apart from, I'll mention one or two things, but uh, even the Sahaba, they differed in terms of, did the Prophet see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, or did he not see him? Was it just a conversation, discussion with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, or was it he saw him physically with his eyes, he saw Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? So there are two narrations, uh, sorry, there's, there's one narration where um, the Sahaba asks the Prophet that did you see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when you went to the furthest point, beyond the furthest point. And his reply in different versions is that how could I see him? He is Noor. Right? That's it. That's what I've come across. Um, so there's nothing authentic. Um, that describes what happens afterwards. However, what we do know is definitely at that point that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala um, gives him the order for the salah. The actual happenings of what happened with, between the Prophet and as he met Allah isn't very much detailed in the hadith that have been narrated. Uh, we have almost like a glimpse uh, of what happened. There's a long hadith which is narrated by Imam Bukhari and others is that he met Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and there Allah gave him uh, the gift of uh, as salah But no doubt there was other things that were, were spoken, other things that were said. Uh, and it could be from the, the onus of the whole uh, meeting and encounter that the Prophet وسلم, either uh, you know was overwhelmed by it, that he could not recall exactly what was said or maybe because it was a private uh, meeting that he didn't want to actually engage or uh, expose to others what had been said between him and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala but great it was a great meeting uh, he managed now to meet uh, his Lord who has sent him he has chosen him uh, all this time the Prophet knew that he was chosen by Allah for a spectacular uh, event and a great mission. Now he's meeting the one who has sent him, the one who has uh, directed to him, the one who has sent down the Qur'an on him, the one that is giving him the comfort, the one that he directs his ibadah and prayers and, and, and love and so on towards. So without doubt it's a great meeting. During that we know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave the Prophet a number of things. Uh, one of those things, uh, and, and the most important, is the salah, the obligation uh, of salah. But there are other things as well that the Prophet ﷺ was given uh, as well, some, some majestic words, some of the athkar, which now he is being given from uh, the treasures which are under uh, the throne, like, uh, for example, la hawla wa la quwwata illa billah, and other, uh, access to other great uh, words and uh, invocations which have been specified for him. Uh, what we do know uh, is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam 50 uh, prayers to pray every single day. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was so dedicated to Allah, uh, he just took them wholeheartedly. Okay? And he came back, when he was coming back, Musa met him on the way. And Musa alayhi wa asks him, what, because uh, he knows, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has called Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And he knows he will, he will give him something, some responsibility. 
just like Musa alayhi salam, he was called for, you know, 40 days and 40 nights and he was called to Mount Tur and, you know, he was given, uh, he, he was also given a huge responsibility after his meeting with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Um, so he asks the Prophet what did your Lord give you? What happened? في ليلة تتزيا بالنور والإشراق جبريل جاء النبي يدعوه فوق البراق هو النبي الأمين له الصعاب تهون وقوله قول صدق وفعله مأمون أجب نداء السماء يا سيد الأنبياء أجب نداء السماء يا سيد الأنبياء